since there are only three, I'll put one here, just in case. Absolutely. Hi, how are you? What you reading? What's the book? Book about Soul Train. Some nice public transportation. Yes. Um, Liz Lerman gave me her book. Uh, Welcome, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you. My name is Josh Costello. I am the artistic director of Aurora Theatre Company. Uh, and uh, on behalf of Aurora and Shotgun Players and Z Space and Calling Up Justice and Theatre Bay Area, I want to welcome you to our space. Uh, this is, yeah, we can give a round of applause. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to hand it over to our panelists and get the conversation started, but just first, real quick, I uh, want to say this. Um, when we announced this event, uh, and when we uh, announced uh, our commitment to the community, which is something we post in our lobby and on our website and, uh, and in our programs, we get a lot of questions from our audience. Our audience is not shy about letting us know what they think. And some of those uh, responses and questions are very positive, and some of them are, uh, are negative, and some of them are, are very confused. Um, we've had a lot of people asking, why are you doing this? Why are you talking about something other than the art? Um, and, uh, and does this really happen that much in Berkeley, really? Uh, and uh, so I want to just address that real quick as just to, to frame this conversation a little bit. Uh, yes, it does really happen in Berkeley, and yes, it is really important. I believe that a theater is the storyteller for its community, and I believe in the unique and visceral power of theater to change lives and strengthens communities. And that can only happen if people come to the theater. Uh, uh, and if you come to the theater and you are made to feel unwelcome, uh, you're probably not going to come back. And so I think it is incumbent upon theaters to listen to people when they, are, when they tell us, um, I was made to feel unwelcome in your space. It's really important that we listen, that we believe them, uh, and that we take action. And so I'm, I'm very pleased uh, that we have these uh, partners who all agreed that this was a conversation that was important to have and that we were able to put together this amazing panel um, to talk about it. So thank you so so much to all of you for being here, to you guys, to HowlRound for streaming us live around the, around the world, uh, and to everyone, so thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our panel. We have uh, Sean San Jose, Bay Area theater legend uh, of Campo Santo, uh, Claudia Alec of Calling Up Justice, who is a big expert in these issues. She's been consulting with us and working with our board and our staff, uh, and uh, uh, really excited to have Claudia here, and Lee Rondon Davis of Shotgun Players. They have have been the uh, dramaturg for our production of Exit Strategy earlier this year, uh, and they are an expert on this stuff as well. And Lee, I think, is going to be moderating this panel. So welcome, you guys. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Um, we're really excited that we're having this conversation and being able to share space with all of you. Um, so to kick us off, uh, we're going to do some group agreements. And they're not rules necessarily, but things that we suggest to make the conversation as productive and respectful and thoughtful as possible. Um, so one thing that I really love is speaking from I, me, my perspective. So like I just said, I love this activity. Not everyone in this room loves this activity, right? So that helps us avoid generalization, speaking for people who may not be represented, or misspeaking for someone else who might be sitting right next to you. So that's really important. And we'll try and remind you of that very kindly and gently as the night goes on, in case you forget, which you probably won't. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Claudia, can I hand it off to you for... Sure. Uh, well, she, I was asked what would be a good group agreement, and I said one of my favorites is WAIT, which is an acronym for why am I talking <laughs> <laughs> or why aren't I talking? Some of y'all are going to have some really good questions and ideas, and there might be reasons of shyness that you don't want to speak, but ask yourself that question and help us hear from everyone. We want to hear from all. WAIT. Mm -hmm. Do you have any group agreements you'd like to add? Okay, I have one more then. Okay. Um, so, we are live streaming right now, and I love that there's a, a, a larger conversation happening online. When there's a hashtag, so I will be plugged in but present, mm -hmm. and um, possibly tweeting or checking out what other people are tweeting during the conversation, plugged in but present. Okay. 
I, I promise not to go on Facebook, though, and just have a <laughs> random conversation. Yeah, and we invite you to engage with us. Our hashtag is welcome to our space. You can tag Aurora or any of the other participating theater companies, um, but you'll see there's someone from Aurora uh, who is doing a great job kind of keeping track of this conversation if technology, if that's how you like to engage. Um, so that'll get us into our first point, the definition of microaggressions. Um, does anyone, do folks in the audience know what a microaggression is that might be able to share out their definition, what they think a microaggression is? Yeah. Ooh, that's a really way of making of that bite side. Small things that we say that may not feel so small to someone else. Mm. It has an impact on them, so thank you. Any other thoughts about what a microaggression is? Maybe a definition that you've heard or have come up with for yourself? That's all good. Well, I'm gonna give it to Claudia to give us her definition of what a microaggression is. What I love about language is that it's giving us the tool to talk about something very complex. So this one word holds a whole lot. Instead of us getting into the minutia of me talking about what a micro assault is, a micro insult, a micro invalidation, I'm just gonna give you a quick nutshell definition of it. But ultimately, we're gonna be talking about what we're talking about for the rest of this conversation. And knowing what the word microaggression is, that's not actually the important part. So, the term was created by um, a psychiatrist and Howard University professor, Chester M. Pierce, in the 1970s, and in the height of all ironies, he received just massive microaggressions when he suggested um, that, this, that this scholarship used to describe insults and dismissals that he regularly witnessed non-black Americans inflict on African Americans. Um, the, the, a lot of folks in the field were like, oh, that's nothing. We don't need to worry about that. What are you even talking about? So one of the biggest parts of microaggressions is that they are, they're really easy to dismiss or to deny. Um, psychologist Daryl Wing Sue defines microaggressions as brief, everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to certain individuals because of their group membership. Does that feel like it gives more clarity about what that word, I feel like we gotta talk about what we're talking about though. Can we get, can we get some examples? Yeah, all right, cool, yeah. Um, so I'm going to speak again from my own perspectives. I don't claim to be an expert in any of this, but I am an expert of my own lived experiences. So for me, um, some when I was asked to be a part of this panel and what some things I might be able to talk about are um, complaining about gender neutral restrooms. That is a microaggression. For folks in our spaces who identify as non-binary or trans, um, folks who have the privilege of being cisgender, um, they can really hurt uh, folks in our community that are gender non-conforming or trans. Um, so they, a bathroom line that may be longer or a bathroom that may not look the way you expect it to, it may be a safer space for someone um, and a minor inconvenience for you, but a safe space for someone who um, identifies as different genders. Um, also, policing audience members' behaviors uh, is another thing that happens a lot in theater spaces, and that can be microaggressive behavior, particularly when we're thinking about like racial dynamics. Um, so I have one example here at Aurora. I was dramaturging, uh, dramaturging a show, Exit Strategy, and uh, an older white patron uh, decided to scold me on how loud I was laughing uh, at parts of the play that were very funny. How many of you saw Exit Strategy? There were some funny parts in that play, yeah. So I'm here as a member of the creative team. I'm paid to be here and someone uh, talks down to me and it scolds me on how loud I'm laughing at a play that is supposed to be funny. Um, and I'm an employee here um, and I'm made to feel unsafe in my place of employment. Um, so that's an example of a microaggression. Do you guys have any other examples? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the... Good evening. <laughs> no. I just have to remember we're just having a conversation, too. And I think one of the things, too, that I, I'm thinking about in terms of microaggressions is we, we've all, all of a sudden got really uh, micro about it. So we're talking about interactions in the theater with us. But microaggressions, for me, come every, as a person of color, as anyone that is othered in any way, I think, Microaggression 
it's great to have that reference to it to remember where it came from and how long it's existed. But to me, I've always experienced it as it's just another strand of racism. So mm -hmm. othering, you know, prejudicing, whatever terminology we want to use. So um, I think we're going we're gonna to focus it down in terms of how it, it exists. And I imagine most of us are theater people. So how we interact in the world of theater and rooms like this and lobbies like that or coming into or out of it. But it's only an issue in here because it's a major issue in real, actual life. So, mm -hmm. and like much of the work all of us do in theater, we're trying to reflect the real world in these pretend spaces. I think we're also trying to address this real world, really daily, sometimes uh, minute to minute issue for some folks uh, inside of the theater. So I just, just to pull it back for a second before mm -hmm. we, we dig back into it is that it's, uh, you know, whatever we think of, like, oh, I, I, I don't trip, that has never happened to me inside the theater. Uh, that's an interesting thing about how we observe or respond to a play. Once we walk out of here, it's still going to exist. It's still an issue. It's still a problem. So I think uh, it's just, I, I think it's important to drop that back in there, too. Mm -hmm. um, I love a dashiki. Like, I think they've got pockets in the front, beautiful, colorful prints. I love a dashiki. I rock dashikis a lot. Um, and recently, in a lobby, a very lovely person came up to me and asked me where I was from. And I was mystified, because I've actually never received that specific micro. I've received so many. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was a fascinating exchange, because it allowed me to say, oh, because I was like, I'm, 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 I'm from here. Like, why, why would, and, and it was really honestly me, just me, like, mystified. Why would you ask? And then she reminded me, oh, you're wearing an outfit that to someone else might read as, I'm potentially from a different country? Although that doesn't make any sense to me because I wear dashikis all the time and I bought them all in the United States. So it was very confusing. <laughs> but that was a microaggression, a racialized microaggression. But the one that I often get is folks being like, um, like, ooh, what happened to you? What's, what's up with your leg? Um, oh, what'd you do to yourself, girl? Uh, which is never a pleasant conversation or a chill conversation to have in a lobby or a public space. I mean, for me it is, because you know, it's like it's a muscle disorder, but what if it had been like a car accident or some traumatic story that I'm being asked to tell? I get triggered every time somebody asks me to identify my, my body. I'm like, we're not close friends like that. <laughs> Yeah. And it's important to like recognize that all of us can perpetrate microaggressions, right? Like I have done it myself. I own that and I'm working to be better. And so this is not just a statement that it's white just white people that commit white microaggressions. It's just straight people or um cisgender people. All of us can do it. And it's all based in implicit and bias basically. Um so one of the next things we want to talk about connected to that is the difference between intent and impact. People that uh, perpetrate microaggressive behavior are not necessarily bad people. Like all of us in this room, we're all good people and we make mistakes. And sometimes the things you say, you may mean it one way, but the way it's perceived or the way it lands on someone else may be harmful or hard or traumatic to deal with. So it's the small things that are said that may feel small to you as they're coming out of your mouth that actually have a much bigger and negative impact on the person receiving it. And it's hard to figure out when or when, when that will or won't happen, um, but it's all something we have to learn and do together. Uh, so a lot of the responses we got to this event, um, some, some of the people that had the more negative responses, uh, was that, you know, these young people are just too sensitive and everyone needs to lighten up and take a step back. And this is from a person who identified as an older white Oakland uh, resident, uh, presumably with the best intentions and their own ideas on what, how to solve this. But it's more than that. It's just, it's more than young people being overly sensitive. It's more than folks of marginalized identities being, you know, too PC or too cranky about stuff. We should all just let it go. 
it means someone's emotional and mental and sometimes even physical safety when um, microaggressions are being perpetrated against them. Do you have anything to add, friends? Well, I'm thinking of that really lovely, um, um, there's, a, there's a video that has um, somebody getting, getting a bunch of uh, bee stings. Mm. And that's supposed to be a metaphor for uh, microaggressions. And, th and it felt like that ma it made a lot of sense to me. Um, because in the micro dose, it doesn't feel like a big deal. In the micro, it's like, oh, that was a weird thing that just happened. But then if it happens all the time over and over again, there's a cumulative effect. Um, you know, I'll sometimes have conversations with my Lyft drivers about the intrusive identifying question of where are you from? And asking them how do they deal with it? Because I'm curious. I want to find out how other pe folks deal with this as well. Um, and, uh, and a lot of them explained to me also that this was about power dynamics, um, where they, 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 the driver, recognized that their passenger was not trying to be mean or bad to them, was just groping for a conversation. Um, but they, as the driver, did not have the ability to interrupt that without endangering their ability to do their job. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's a part of it too. Like when it's audience to audience member, the power dynamics might be the same, but if it's an audience member who's been attending the theater for like ever and has such ownership of this space, that could really make someone feel like they don't belong. Mm -hmm. And for me, walking into a room that is predominantly older white folks where I don't necessarily see myself represented and the people that are listening and attending is a little bit nerve-wracking. Like, I had to address my own bias coming here today because, I'm gonna be honest with you, I was emotionally preparing for the worst. <laughs> I've had some not so great talk back and panel experiences where I have been truly traumatized and um, deeply offended. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm going into today. I emailed all of my theater community. I was like, y'all, I need y'all to come out because I don't know what's gonna happen. But that's bias. I assumed the worst of people in this room that actually are probably here with the best intentions. Like, you showed up tonight for this panel on a Monday night when you could be at home not doing something else that you maybe enjoy more. Um, and you're here to learn and listen. And that was unfair of me to assume that about you. And I think those assumptions are at the core of microaggressions. We're just assuming. We're going off of what we think we know about the world or what we've been taught about the world. And sometimes we have to dig a little bit deeper. Although. And I want to give you time to speak. I feel like I've been talking a lot. I don't want to dismiss the fact that sometimes folks do have ill intent. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they're doing the microaggression because they know they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. It's that person who comes at up to you at the party and they're smiling and then they say something that's just really offensive, but they recognize the social mores of the scene won't allow you to react. And somehow it makes it bad if you, the person who just received the insult, react like, whoa, that was insulting, then that person who did it somehow can scold you uh, for, for raising your voice or behaving inappropriately. Mm -hmm. So generally, people have good intent, but ultimately I don't think intent matters. It's impact that matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this isn't the conversation part. I think you're covering it well. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, we have a question, a couple of questions for you. How many of you feel like you have been the recipient of microaggressions? Show of hands. And if you don't feel like raising your hand, that's also okay too. Um, you can answer with your spirit. Uh, how many of you feel like you may have inflicted a microaggression onto someone else? Yeah. It's like a real universal thing that we're all struggling with and working through together. So I appreciate you for being here. And I apologize we didn't say this at the start, but we're going to kind of breeze through some of these conversation topics, and then there will be time for questions. So please feel free to take notes. You may have received the note cards. If you want to run and grab one, you're welcome to and jot down questions, because we'll have time for both the written ones and also any live questions that may happen. So the next big question is, how do you avoid microaggressive behavior? And the answer is, <laughs> thank you, Josh. Our dear, dear Vanna. <laughs> um, so how do you avoid microaggressive behavior? You can't. You simply can't. Claudio, would you like to share more? 
Uh, well, I made a joke about it. I said you could stay at home, but then you'd also have to stay off the internet as well and not watch television. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I do think the, 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 be the better question is um, how can we, uh, as a group, maybe identify some of the microaggressions that are taking place in our spaces, and how can we not avoid them, but create the capacity to respond to them? Oh, do you want to speak more to how to respond to microaggression? <laughs> I feel like I've got lots of answers because I've been thinking about this for a long time, but I also sense that the audience, the, the human beings who are in this space, we've got a room full of experts here. We have experts in audiencing, experts in theater making, experts in leading, experts in talking about theater. I would like to hear, I would love to hear from them, but I will let you all know that I'm a gigantic nerd and I did bring my three Ds and five Rs of how how to respond, because I love alliteration. Um, but I'd rather, I'd rather hear from the audience before I give my, my here's a list. <laughs> Any thoughts on how to respond? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts on how to respond to microaggressions? Oh, yes. May I respond? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm thinking about the American theater article that Dominique Morrisot wrote about her experience. Was it at the Public Theater in New York? I forget which which audience she was in, but um, you know, she she wrote the article. I think I think actually she wrote the Facebook post, and we all were like, "Yes, girl, that's exactly what happens." Yes, yes, yes to that. And I think it was a similar experience to the story that you were telling, where she was audiencing, and another older patron decided to instruct her how to audience correctly. And what they were really doing was. Um, instructing her to not do call and response to a play that required call and response, that asked for call and response. They were they were critiquing her 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 audiencing, her her black performativity as an audience member. Mm -hmm. um, so so I go to the place of specific examples are useful, but they don't have to be about this this specific theater. I just had a great conversation two days ago with folks in museum culture, and we were talking about how. Um, sometimes the literal physical space can be a microaggression. Like sometimes the signage lets you know you're not welcome. That mm -hmm. space isn't for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fact that it's all stairs and I just go, oh, this performance venue didn't have me in mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of a microaggression that the space is doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm in the same world though. I love examples. Um, but I feel like there might be more stories that we could hear from. I don't know. Yes. If you feel comfortable, it, it's for you. Yeah, you decide. Okay. <laughs>
Great point. Thank you. And I think that that's a part of me. That's why the challenge is I want to make sure that the integrity of the move is whole mm -hmm. and, not, and I'm not just icing your cake and getting changed in the region. Mm. to to a meaningful place and they'll let the change pour out of that rather than here's the change we're doing and try to backfill because I think if the lead we have to lead our audiences we have to lead our boards we have to lead our communities on this journey uh, some of us myself we've been privileged to go ahead and see where that the journey is long but some others haven't and so we have to uh, kind of hand through that and so would, I think for me I'm as I'm hearing that story it's like what could I have done at my theater could we have had, you know, people in the lobby ushering, I mean, you know, sharing about this and helping to protect the space and prop the door open? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, what? but that's the more holistic change that has to happen, and then the icing on the cake comes later. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm taking away from, from your story and from my own experience. No, just quickly, there's a, I don't know. There's a oh, we're live streaming, oh, I'm sorry, and me. our audience complained. They were like, we can't hear the other people talking. <laughs> and you have now witnessed a microaggression, excuse me. Um, there's a Lutheran church on College Avenue that on, on, the, on the restroom, there's a sign that says, roses are red, violets are blue, gender's not binary, this restroom's for you. And it's very clear. <laughs> So thank you for hosting this. I don't want to get emotional, but I am. Because theater is a place of creativity and welcoming. And I invite people who I identify with. You may not see me. I identify as black. And that's part of my family. And I have Latinx. And when I have friends say, I do not want to go to a theater where I do not see myself reflected or I don't feel safe, I, I'm not going to be vulnerable because I don't want to be policed, it crushes me. Mm. So the practices that I find in the theaters that are trying to be open and welcome people of color to their theaters, 
and to make it more accessible for folks that may have income issues. To have the excuse that only people who are getting their tickets, purchasing their tickets off of Gold Star or some other way, have to provide their, their ID to get their tickets is not acceptable. And I've had that happen in multiple theaters. Even when I buy tickets for my family and friends and I'm not using that, my darker skinned family members get asked for their ID. Mm -hmm. The younger ones who are darker skinned get asked for their ID. The lighter skinned people don't. So I would recommend that no matter whether you're a subscriber or whatever, that every theater, if you're gonna have pick up tickets, you ask everybody for their ID. Mm. Yeah, if you guys just split that, you can both talk into it. Thank you. Well, a lot of the things that I've been hearing um, kind of go to this point of how to avoid microaggressions is by being intentional with your choices. So in the terms of that restroom, uh, it was a great idea in theory, but it lacked intentionality in that it lacked the the forethought of like, what do we do in the moment? Who can people go to if they have questions or um, don't feel safe for whatever reason? And the important thing to keep in mind is like, yes, you may not like the smell of this new bathroom or you may not like having to wait in a longer line, but it means that someone feels safe. It means that someone feels seen and validated in their own identity and experience. And what we should be doing is looking out for the people who are most vulnerable in our communities. That's what I try to do. I think of all the ways that I have privilege or I am able to walk through life with ease without having to think about certain things and then I take time to think about the people that may have more difficulty um, in various aspects of life, whether that's physical differences, whether that's um, gen their gender expression or gender identity. Um, all of these things we can take a little bit of time to be empathetic and compa compassionate for people who may just ha need a little bit more support. Um, yeah, so thank you. Or another alternative to that asking for IDs thing is don't ask for IDs. Right? There are people in our communities that cannot provide a form of identification. So are they excluded from theater experiences? How do we make our spaces more accessible? How do we make sure that um, as many people as possible can come and engage with our work and walk out feeling, having a positive experience and a positive transformation um, in the same way that we all are able to? like uh, accessibility in terms of um, ticket costs. A lot of theaters are moving to pay what you can models or if no one turned away for lack of fund uh, funds models, that means no matter how much money you have, you can come see theater. Um, and that can, it's difficult, I understand as a theater maker to raise those funds or to figure it out, but there are a lot of great organizations and people in your communities that would happily subsidize that. All you gotta do is ask. Yeah, providing information and context for institutional changes. I hate change. I hate it. I don't want to like, I walk into Target and they've moved something around and I'm like, I cannot be here right now. <laughs> um, and, but also I realize in the example of Target, it's probably to sell more things, but sometimes those changes are to, again, make someone feel more comfortable or um, open up our space a little bit more for a group that may not have felt as safe there. So all of these things. So sometimes you're getting frustrated or I find myself you know, a little panicked about the change and I have to like pause and give myself a reality check and think about who may be benefiting from this um, thing that is new and a little bit uncomfortable for me. And you gotta face that discomfort with compassion and bravery and just all your gumption to take the next step and be a part of a more welcoming world. Um, so I definitely don't want to lose the really beautiful comment that kicked this conversation off. I regret us not having the microphone ready when you were telling us that story because it was a really great example of what are some of the steps you need to do if you're going to respond as an individual. Um, but I did want to highlight something that was really gorgeous about this exchange around bathrooms um, that's more institutional. So this is a performance that we're doing together, right? And uh, you know, all the world's a stage. And um, if you're trying to to change that in real life uh, performance, maybe you're doing staff trainings. 
you know, like maybe you've had a lot of like uh, g gendered uh, microaggressions happening in your workplace, and so you've decided to do the sexual harassment training, right? The problem is, does the audience go to that training? Who gets to go to that training? So we're setting up the um, circumstances for a performance. How are we being really thoughtful about what we are setting up within that performance? So you told me a story, uh, sir, of a, um, of a sign that let folks know, not only is this a gender neutral bathroom, but do not police others' genders. With the, and, and also it was cute and had a rhyme to it, it was very cool. Um, so I'm curious about that institutional way of, uh, of helping folks to perform better in the space. I mean, I think that that's, there's two big conversations we're having. One is personal experiences and personal, I don't know what to call it, obligation, dilemmas, but then also the question I was asking us as we sort of talked about this is, it's, the, it's on the, the, the host. If we throw in a party, if I'm inviting you in my house, I, I'm, I'm gonna set the tone for the rules, the mm. vibe, the mm -hmm. tenor, the temperature, whatever you wanna call it. So part of that, I would say almost entirely, that is on the host. Because I'm not gonna have someone come over and be like, you can't do that. Hey man, get your thing off the thing, unless I say, hey, oh, in, in the crib we don't wear shoes, could you do that or not do that? So mm. off jump, you're like, okay, that's kind of da, 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 da. small minor example. But in the same state, I'm not gonna tell anybody when I invite them to a show that we do, oh, you gotta act this way, you can't act that way. Our rules are you can't be this, you can't be that. I, don't, I would never throw a party like that. I would never have people over to dinner like that. So part of it is the cultural experiment. We gotta get in there and think, but I think there's two things to work on. All the people that are with organizations, lead organizations, make rules for organizations, or have the heaviest thumbs to push through suggestions for organizations, have to have one big conversation so that there is a science that we all agree with saying we're gonna put the thing on the bathroom because we believe in that. Or to your example, one that obviously didn't work well for you, you know, over there where you go, here's the new rule, you do the thing. Because there's a huge divide between people making changes at the top and then how it happens in the bathroom or how it happens at the door. If, if the person at the front door is in those whatever executive meetings, they just tell me, well, oh, let's do the thing. So it's on us that invite people into a space to sort of set tone off top. And then I think the hard, the, I think that's a much easier conversation to have, a lot of work, but it's a much easier conversation as opposed to what you're bringing up, what you're bringing up. I, I feel both of you on that. I don't know the answer, I especially don't know the answer to what you're saying. Like, I don't know what to do either. I also think it's about empowerment. I don't know what to do either if I'm in this space and I see someone, unless someone's crazily out of pocket, I don't know how to go like, hey, you, you can't do this or that. I mean, that's, a, that's some kind of policing too. So I, I think all of this rambling to say, we've got two, two conversations to have. And I think there are many theater makers and people from theater organizations in here. And I think we should be filing that. Mm. And going, oh, they, they're experiencing this. I'm gonna put this whole list together and put it to, to those people. And then there's the one that I think is a much more open-ended I don't know what we do kind of conversation because I would say in response to your thing, they're fucking. I wouldn't go to a place like that. <laughs> Seriously, no, straight up. If you treat me like that, if you treat me like I'm, then fuck you. I'm not going to do anything. And I'm sorry to use that kind of language, but that's, that's a microaggression to me when you say that. But well, you gotta do this. No, I don't have to do anything, Jack. I don't have to do anything to enter your thing, and I shouldn't have to do anything. And that's where the aggression part of microaggression comes through. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to correct you. That's not a microaggression. Having an anger response is not a negative a, thing. A, a it's a good thing. Though, a microaggression <laughs> is someone telling me, you got to do something that not everyone else has to do. And that's where I was mm, like, nah, mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I will check you on that if you're checking me. I'm not some bad people go, I'm going to check you. But <laughs> I, go, I go home all head and, you know, you know, man, I feel bummed. I feel bad. I feel whack. I feel weak. I feel left out. I feel not included. So that's what I feel like. But I'm saying in terms of addressing it, I think that's, all I'm saying there's a personal way and there's an organizational way. 
Mm -hmm. Personal way, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to be like, I don't know what the heck to do. Or I'm going to be like Matt Epson. Or organizationally, I'm going to go, we don't allow that policy. That policy is bullshit that says you can't, we're going to do this to a certain number of people, and we're not going to do it to other people. Um, we have two lanes that I think we have to deal with as theater people, as people people, you know, different things. I'm also wondering how we can get rid of the weird shame um, that's attached to microaggressions, because like that's what stops us from being able to recognize them and solve it as a problem. Um, you know, for instance, we had an audience member who asked, like, should I even name the theater it took place when this takes place in every single theater? Every single one, we can have a contest, and maybe some folks on HowlRound can tweet us and try and tell me about their theater, but I think it's every single theater and all the museums as well. Um, so how can that theater set up the circumstances that allow you, the audience member, to have your really smart idea about how they can fix what was failing? Because they were trying to do a thing, you witnessed it failing, you had some really good ideas that for, that for, so they could potentially improve it, but how can, how could they invite you to give them that feedback? Can we, what you, well, hello? <laughs> this is like an echo, okay. Um, what you just brought up about shame is why I'm here actually, because um, I've been going to live theater at Berkeley Rep, um, Aurora, ACT, uh, as a subscriber with my grandmother, and then when she passed, um, I took over. Um, and I've observed the same um, microaggression in myself that I, that I want to act on, but I don't because I feel shame towards this vulnerable population, um, which are um, typically elders with, who are hard of hearing. And when they're fumbling around with the hard of hearing devices, and on top of that, the other part of it is, um, and I'm noticing really nervous, and my heart's racing as I as I talk about this, because that's why I'm here today, actually, to bring this um, this aspect uh, to, to light of, of theater experience. Um, is when the, um, the people who are hard of hearing I notice talking quite loud during the performance. And I feel um, entitled, and I have some shame around that too, that it should be a social etiquette, a certain level of quiet. And I want to say something, I want them to stop talking, but I don't talk to them directly. I go to the theater staff, but in my experience, having been a subscriber, the same typical people that I notice making the, the loud comments during the performance, They'll, and then also like with the rappers sometimes too, but that's <laughs> that's an aside. It's mainly though the talking and fumbling with the sound devices, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do because it, it just really upsets me and frustrates me. But I never talk to the people themselves because I feel um, like I don't have a place to do that since um, I, I have empathy that that they're hard of hearing and and they should have an enjoyable theater experience too, and they're doing the best they can. So what do you recommend? <laughs> oh, this, this other audience member seems to have an answer. I am very excited. Hi, so my husband is profoundly hearing impaired and my father is um, severely hearing impaired. Those are categories. My husband is essentially deaf in his left ear. Uh, actor has been um, going through increasing amounts of hearing aids, has a cochlear implant now in his right ear. I mean, this is extensive, and it's been going on since he was 30. Um, one of the things that's a huge problem for us, well, first of all, the assisted hearing devices only work for some people. You have to turn off and remove your hearing aids in most cases to use them, which means they have very little feeling, body feeling, for the volume that they're speaking at. They really don't know. Um, I, I get this all the time with my dad and my, my husband. The second thing is um, open caption performances are, Few and far between and very few theaters do them. Open caption performances are a miracle for the audience members who can't hear well, for people who are in the deaf community, for the family members of those people. I am lucky if there is one show, one showing per um, performance that's happening of a particular play that's open captioned. It's, they're very, very rare. And it strikes me as odd because they're so useful. The other thing that happens with that is in some places, like Berkeley Rep, 
um, not in the main stage, in the older stage, which I love that space, um, we were seeing, I can't, Treasure Island maybe, and um, there was an open caption performance, and the audience seating, because for open caption performances you get special seats so that you can see the captions better, the audience seating was on one side, one of the, the funny sides as you first come in on audience right, and the open captions were being projected up onto the wall on audience right, which means you cannot read them and see the show at the same time at all. And I've had that happen multiple times. I actually found the grant information and sent in a request for Berkeley Rep to get the grant for open captioning devices. Um, I, yeah. And so, for example, um, down in San Jose, Broadway San Jose, they have every show has a Saturday performance that has two ASL signers. Like, automatic, guaranteed. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, it, this is a huge problem. And just for contrast, um, in Oregon Shakespeare Festival, they use open captioning not only for English-speaking audiences, but they will have open captioning that's in Spanish, for example. It completely changes the dynamic of the audience. It completely changes who comes to see the shows. It's wonderful. And I don't understand why there isn't more of that. If you, It doesn't have to be a very expensive technology at all. <laughs> It's also important to remember, at least I try to remind myself in these moments, like I have misophonia, so chewing sounds, like if somebody's eating a snack, they like make me like nauseous and like physically uncomfortable. Um, but I recognize that it's a me issue. And that's hard to like come to terms with, right? So I have come up with coping me mechanisms for myself. So sometimes that just means I have to move farther away from someone, um, but, and you know, do that kindly. I'm not glaring at them and huffing as I do that, like the woman did when I was laughing too loud. She got up and moved mid-show, huffing the whole time. She's talking too loud. You know, it's it's a me issue. I I, I take that and I just quietly find a you know, a discreet time to move myself. Um, I bring earplugs to things a lot of times. Um, and I also remind myself that theater is a communal experience. Like, I could sit at home and watch a movie and be by myself if that's what I wanted to happen. But some, part for me, part of the beauty of going to theater is sitting in an audience of living, breathing people experiencing the same thing at the same time, and that's the only time that thing happens. And I have to like remind myself of that and fill myself with a little bit of grace and fortitude and say like, I, I, I come to theater for this reason so that I can share space with uh, folks of all abilities and um, all different walks of life. And it's really, really hard. And um, I appreciate you for bringing up that question and acknowledging that for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. This, this might have some resonance. Um, so I'm thinking about, there was this um, a video on Twitter where um, a, a woman's sitting in a seat and she leans back on the airplane and the, uh, and the guy, he's in the back one, so he can't lean back. So there's no room, he's incredibly uncomfortable and he starts to like push the seat. And then there's this huge conversation where some people are like, oh, well that was obviously wrong. And others being like, no, she was obviously wrong. She should have asked if she could lean back. And I said, you know who's wrong? The airline. Because they set up a situation where there would be conflict between two passengers. Um, and, and it shouldn't be on the passengers to fix that, really. Um, but I, I, I do want to remind myself and the audience, though, that we are talking about um, power dynamics. So um, it's complicated. You can have conflict between two audience members, and that might not necessarily be the thing that we're talking about right now, microaggressions, which are really just trying to, we're just trying to figure out how can we make our spaces the most welcoming to marginalized audiences. Hmm. I'm also leaning into your question that you started us off with, which was, you know, how do you, or maybe this was a question that was sparked by your comment, uh, which is how do you set the conditions for the right kind of party? Like we all know that we don't take off our shoes and put our feet on the back of the seats in the theater or the airplane. We know that we don't do this. That's bad behavior. How do we know? How do we communicate what those behaviors are supposed to be? Audience? Hey. Uh, I can try it loudly. Um, 
One group of people charged with that task are ushers, who are usually, in many theaters, not all, are volunteers who do it once in a while. But we have every season, I usher here, I usher at Berkeley Rep, I've done it for many years. We get a packet of instructions about what our role is and what we're supposed, what problems we're supposed to take care of, as well as how to welcome people into the space. It's really explicit. It sometimes puts us in weird positions. Now the house managers will often say, if you're uncomfortable doing some of these things, come get us. But that isn't, they're running around, like where are they? Especially Berkeley Rep, which is huge. And so we're the ones that are supposed to figure out if differently abled people are comfortable and have everything they need and find the language to ask that, you know. And we're the ones who are giving out the assistive listening devices and trying to figure out how loudly to speak or not, or like working that interaction with the line forming. And we're the ones who are, if we're sitting next to someone with their smartphone and they're texting and they're doing stuffing during the show, if we're, if we're supposed to take care of that problem if it's right there, but in the middle of a show, it's kind of awkward and it's like, mm, is the, how big of a problem is this? And like, uh, and, and do I want to alienate somebody who just paid to be here, who feels okay doing this thing? Mm -hmm. It's really there are. And then watching my other uh, fellow ushers, which span uh, run the gamut of like mm -hmm. rule followers versus more flex. You know, so it's like <laughs> there are the ones who are like, these are the rules. Do you understand? These are the rules. They please. This is. It's, you must do this thing, and I'm like, oh, this is embarrassing. And then I'm like, the ones that are like, oh, anything goes, and I'm like, well, it's not quite right either. So I just, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there that in many places these are volunteer people who are actually put in sort of weird positions sometimes, and it's not always easy to figure it out. I am sure I have said the wrong thing to people like giving out the assistive listening devices, I was saying, I was trying to gauge like how loudly to speak, because if I speak really loudly, then people like, who that's not helpful for, take offense, you know? Or if I say, um, do you have a hearing aid? Because it, there's relevant instructions if you do when you're giving one of those out, then people take offense. Do I look like I need a hearing aid? I'm like, okay, how do I phrase this in a way? <laughs> it's like, and having to do it in real time for a job I do like once a year. You know, because we all switch off jobs. So I'm just throwing that out there as um, that is one of the groups that is tasked with trying to figure this out on the fly mm -hmm. in these spaces. And it's not always so easy, actually. Anyway. I can, yeah, a new person can speak. I find that giving people an option often works. So example, um, in a theater where people are texting, if an usher came, came up to somebody and said, uh, sir, ma'am, if you need to use your iPhone, if you could step outside and do that, then you're giving them the option of either stopping it or stepping outside, and then they can choose. <laughs> Um, hi, I work um, at ACT in the conservatory. Um, I had a response for uh, you about um, uh, the audience um, uh, interaction of like noise level. I used to work um, quite frequently at a deaf theater uh, in New York. And one thing we used to do um, in the box office, especially for hearing patrons, was to um, give them the disclosure. Just so you know, um, the audience might not be um, the type of audience you're used to. It might not be a silent kind of house. Um, so we used to do that specifically for that theater. Um, and um, some questions I wanted to, to ask were, um, uh, do you, or something that's come up in previous discussions about inclusivity for me is, um, or responses rather that I've gotten, 
um, has been um, um, when uh, inclusive practices are when certain like leadership uh, see inclusive practices maybe not necessarily being used for their purpose sometimes those practices stop um, so I'm wondering if in the room if if people think that inclusive practices are contingent upon the, their continuation are contingent upon people using them for their um, intended purposes for example, if you get your open caption funding and grant, if no open caption tickets are bought, would your leadership be upset or stop funding that? Or for, um, so how, how do theater organizations and artists empower their colleagues and budgets to, to plan for these practices as well? Really important to talk to people why things are changing um, and let people know and be a part of the conversation about that and if they have ideas for improvement like that's great that's what we want to open up or if people are confused or uh, don't feel okay with something we can engage in a dialogue I also feel like it's about responsibility right like, like what you just said about if closed caption and performance tickets aren't being so or purchased, right? We don't just give up on that cause. We figure out why those tickets aren't selling. Who do we need to reach out to? And I know for a lot of theater companies, especially the ones that I'm involved with, capacity is a huge issue, which means, which makes it difficult to sometimes further these initiatives or dive in as deeply as we want to. But I also think that we are a bigger theater community. It's not just us making the theater. Um, there are ways for our audiences, our board members, our um, supporters to get involved in meaningful ways and if we create opportunity, I personally feel that if we create opportunities um, for uh, members of our community to get involved, we can get a lot more done. Um, and that's what I personally champion and am working for in the organizations that I work with and I think it's really important. Because um, there's a level of commitment to those things as well. Um, that if it doesn't work, you have to spend more time and more money and more manpower on these things, and that's stressful if you're running a nonprofit organization. Um, I have experienced that, but also it just means someone else has, is able to access your space and feel welcome in it, and that's really important. And I also really want to call out Campo Santo, because every time I go to a Campo show, I feel like I'm at church. I feel like I just walked into, you know, my auntie's house. And like that is a space that I feel really welcome and safe in, um, as opposed to even some of the theaters that I work at, I feel safer there. And that's because I see people like me. I see stories about people from my community or see people that look like me on stage in, in the audience. I feel like my presence is valued and welcomed. And I also, there's a dynamic, like people are invited to experience the piece of art the way they want to experience the piece of art. So at a combo show, you may have people calling in response, you may have people like, mm-hmm, and clapping and snapping, and, and there's no rule on how to enjoy and um, experience this piece of art. And so I wanna call that out, because like Compo is like doing some major work in making their space inclusive. Um, and also they do work all over the Bay Area too, which is not always possible for those of us that are paying rent on a building, but it means that you're in different neighborhoods and you're c making contact with different people and allowing different people to access their work if transportation is an issue. So I think that's really dope and I just wanna call that out. Yeah. I'm hoping we will have a chance in this conversation to maybe surface some best practices, some things people are already doing, because we've got a diversity of theater representatives here in the audience. Um, but I also want to make sure we didn't skip any comments or questions that were happening. Um, I really appreciate this conversation because in my experience, how I think about this is that a lot of that racism and prejudice is systemic, and so you see it in theater policies, 
you see it in the language, you see it in the marketing about who is invited into your home and who is not, into your space. Um, and so part of it for me is thinking of how do you first have a conversation within your home about what those shared values are and making sure that everybody who lives in your home is on the same page about those values. But then also how do you then project those values out into your community, into the folks that you're inviting into your space? So maybe that's in your emails when tickets are going out, letting folks know these are the resources that are available in our space. This is where you can find them. Maybe that's in how you are marketing or pushing for your ushers to make sure that your ushers are actually reflecting the community that you say you want in your space. Um, maybe that's also in the fact that you know you do train your ushers to understand that, hey, these are our community values because I think of it as, I've called it before, um, institutional violence where folks will utilize somebody. I don't know if you know, there was a story about a group of folks that were on a train in wine country and somebody complain to the folks that had authority on the train and that group was kicked out for being too loud, for over enjoying themselves, for being ratchet as they were called. Um, but had that company kind of did some preliminary work, maybe that person that was used to do that institutional violence of throwing those folks off the, the train would have never responded in that way. Um, and for a reminder for myself when I'm in theater spaces to remember my own privilege and where I'm coming from to humanize the people are around me because sometimes having a conversation with folks about what your needs are and what their needs are and how you meet in the middle is the place to start instead of just being like, oh, well, I'm going to tell the usher that this person is eating inside of the theater and that's against the community standards, like, and I want them to be thrown out. Well, maybe that person has, like, a blood sugar issue that you're not thinking about. Um, and so I think those are the things that I think about is community standards and setting and how often and how you iterate that, how that then works into the folks that you invite into your space, that you hire, that you look for for volunteers. And also I think about a lot of what is the history of some of these theater spaces and how do you recognize that when you're inviting folks in and you're trying to to say this narrative of like, this space is also for you to recognize what is that history that people are carrying deep down of all the messages that they've heard you say before to, to hear now what you're saying now. Yes. Thank you. I go to the theater quite a lot and I go to many different kinds of theaters. And entering a theater is much more like a, a social contract. It's unstated, but it is a contract. When one goes to see a Shakespeare play, if people, are to, if people were talking behind me, I would turn around, first I give them my glare, and if that doesn't work, I say something. And then if that doesn't work, I might look for an usher, because getting up to look for an usher is disturbing everybody else around me. On the other hand, if I go to a, something that's a comedy or something light, something like you're describing, where part of the fun and part of what you expect to do is to be laughing out loud, to be uh, calling out, well, that's acceptable, and that's what you're there for. And I think it behooves all of us to know what we're getting into. If we're going to see a Shakespeare play, we're going to behave so that everyone around us can listen to every word, because it's not that easy. On the other hand, if we're going to see a raucous comedy, we're going to laugh out loud, and that's okay, too. So, <laughs> Shakespeare has comedy. I don't mind laughing, but if I can't understand the words, and that's what I'm, I'm there for, if people are, dis are distracting everyone around them, I don't see anything wrong with calling it to their attention. That's just the way I behave. Oh my God! And then you flash on me because 
I'm talking, because we have two different expectations, it's not necessarily the funk between you and I, but whoever says it up above that says, come on into our space. If you say, come on into my space, then I'm going to come on into your space. If you say, you can come in tonight, because we're doing something that you would like tonight, which just happened to me. That's all I got into here. <laughs> you know, so. Then, 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 okay, I get the rules. You gave me the rules at the top, which, again, you know, I don't need to be so general about it, but it's like a dinner party. So you come over to the dinner party, hey, man, don't be bringing no uh, fast food in here. We're doing it different. So we're saying, come on, bring nothing, or just bring yourself, and you know what to do. But if someone did that to me, I would, I would, I would take, I would not only personally take issue with the person trying to check me in a, in a, in a space that you and I both have tickets for, but I would also question the, the institution itself. If the institution is telling you one thing and telling me one thing, then we got a problem. We've got so many good audiences. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to say just one second um, so we can give as many people a chance to respond as possible. I was the recipient of that glare. And the way it made me feel was awful. I felt condescended to. I felt, not necessarily your glare, let me clarify that, but I was the recipient <laughs> of a glare. And uh, within the context, it was a little bit different. Um, but I felt condescended to. I felt um, embarrassed. I felt humiliated. I felt like I didn't deserve to be here in, in the space. And your intention is that you, what, what I understand your intention to be is that you're just trying to hear and understand Shakespeare, but what is received is that um, I am less than this person who's looking at me. And I totally understand where you're coming from and being able to hear and like understand what's going on, especially in these really dense plays or classical work, but intention is different from perception and that small thing can really just fuck up somebody's day. <laughs> like, and it's hard, it's hard to know. Um, but I just wanted to share that, that was my personal experience with that. And I saw a couple of other hands in the space that I wanna give, yeah? Uh, folks that raised your hands. Yes, my friend here and right here. And yeah. Hi. I've worked at a couple of predominantly white-led theater companies in the Bay. I've been here 10 years. I will not call them all out, because I love them all. There's nothing wrong with the organizations. However, just kind of tying back to some things people have said previously, what Sean's saying, it's who you're inviting to the party, it's on you as the host. Me being a black house manager in the Bay Area is kind of an anomaly. So when people walk into spaces, they're not used to seeing me being the welcoming face. So. For one of the theaters that I'm at, the show we're doing right now is all people who look like me. And I will tell you, those grandmas and grandpas cling to me when they walk in the door. <laughs> but there are other places that I've been where they don't look like me and they don't know that I'm actually there to help them feel safe as well. So it's also on the organization to hire people who look like the audience you want to bring in. Because that's gonna really make sure that the message gets out there, that you wanna be loving and welcoming to everyone. That's how you make sure that your social etiquette gets passed on. The people you hire reflect who you wanna bring in. That's gonna change the dynamic of what's happening in your lobbies, in your bathrooms, and in your office conversations. Somebody was a Sure. Oh. Hi, thank you. Uh, hi. So I run a Shakespeare theater. Um, and uh, I don't want to, I think, I really appreciate your frankness in sharing um, how you experience uh, a, like a broad range of work. Um, so I don't intend this to be specifically in response to you, but I think it's interesting that Shakespeare, that you use Shakespeare um, as an example there because um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, that Shakespeare's audiences, number one, were not particularly respectful of each other's <laughs> attention. Um, and that, you know, when you look at the text itself, the, like important information is often repeated three times, right, in three different ways uh, to ensure, Shakespeare wanted to ensure that his audiences um, understood uh, the important points
nuance of the story. Uh, I'm saying that because I think, um, just to connect with a few things that people have been saying here tonight, uh, thank you again for that. It's this notion that I think there's this, this idea that theater has always, has always been like a temple. Right, that theater has always been a place where people uh, arrive in a in a space of like um, obedience and and peace and quietude. Uh, that it's a space where we encounter something divine, right? But actually, when you look at the history of theater, there's a lot to suggest that it's it's kind of the opposite of that. Um, and that it's largely a consequence of our institutions that have, over these many, many decades and generations of audiences, transformed the way we think that people ought to behave in a theater. Um, and so, so I think, you know, in, in that way, it's, it's just very fascinating, it's very interesting, right, to think about sort of like we have an aging audience, and because we have an aging audience, right, hearing becomes, uh, uh, can become an issue for some audiences, and so we find that there's been, you know, there's been perhaps an increase in, um, in efforts to sort of